Welcome to our lecture on the pre-anesthetic agents. These are the different uh, agents that you can use before the induction of anesthesia. In this presentation, we are going to focus on the anticholinergics or the parasympatholytics. Recap. These are the different classes of pre-anesthetic agents that are used before the induction of anesthesia. Uh, this include the anticholinergics or the parasympatholytics. We also have the tranquilizers, the sedatives, and the opioids. The first group of uh, pre-anesthetic agents that we are going to discuss are the anticholinergics. So what is an anticholinergic? So anticholinergic medications or simply anticholinergics are drugs that block and inhibit the activity of the neurotransmitter acetylcholine at both the CNS and the BNS at synapses. So they are also known as parasympatholytics to, because they will uh, influence or they will block the action of acetylcholine, particularly at the parasympathetic nervous system. So acetylcholine is the major neurotransmitter at the parasympathetic nervous system. And what anticholinergic drugs will do is that it will um, inhibit you know, the the actions of the parasympathetic nervous system. They are also known as the sympathomimetics because they will mimic the action of the sympathetic nervous system. Again, when we are going to block or shut down parasympathetic nervous system, what will dominate or predominate is the effects of the sympathetic nervous system. So basically, for the MOA of the anticholinergic drugs, they will specifically inhibit the muscarinic receptors but not the nicotinic receptors, blocking the muscarinic effects. The muscarinic receptors are again found on the heart, the GIT, the bronchi, the glands, and the eyes. Examples of the anticholinergic drugs are atropine and glycopyrrolate. So this is now the uh, MOA of anticholinergic drugs. So we'll start with acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is considered to be a neurotransmitter, major neurotransmitter in the CNS, the ANS, and in the neuromuscular junction. So in this diagram, now this is in the PNS, now in the autonomic nervous system, you have here the spinal cord. Uh, and in the uh, dorsal root ganglion, we have here our preganglionic neuron. It terminates the ganglia to act on the postganglionic neuron. Uh, particularly in here, we have the nicotinic receptor. Uh, the postganglionic neuron terminates at the effector organ or the target organ at the ganglia, and uh, the acetylcholine that will be released in this uh, neuron will act on the muscarinic receptors. So there are two receptors no, under the uh, wherein no, the acetylcholine will be able to bind. We have the nicotinic at the preganglionic, uh, at the ganglia, no, at between the pre and the postganglionic neuron, and we also have the synapse no, between the uh, postganglionic and the target organ. It is also uh, the same with the somatic uh, nervous system. So, of course, in the somatic nervous system, the somatic neuron will uh, release also acetylcholine to bind to nicotinic receptors. So, in this uh, uh, structure here, now of course, the muscarinic receptors and the nicotinic receptors are different from each other you know, because the nicotinic are uh, ligand-gated ion channel, while for the muscarinic receptors, they are uh, G-protein coupled receptors. So, in the case of the anticholinergic drugs, the anticholinergics will only affect the muscarinic receptors on the target organs. They will not be able to uh, affect the muscarinic receptor. So uh, this means that the anticholinergic drugs will only affect the uh, the activities of the muscarinic receptor. So those all the muscarinic effects will be reversed by the uh, anticholinergic drugs. It will affect the muscarinic effects, but not the nicotinic effects of the nicotinic receptor. Um, so therefore, the anticholinergic drugs so in other references, they are also termed as anti-muscarinic drugs no, because they will only affect the muscarinic receptor but not the nicotinic receptor. 
they will block the muscarinic but not the nicotinic receptors. This slide will talk about the pharmacodynamics and the pharmacokinetics of the anticholinergic drugs. So again, uh, the anticholinergic drugs are group of drugs, a no, group of pre-anesthetic drugs that will basically, you know, what it does is it will induce parasympathetic blockade. So this means that it will basically shut down you know, the parasympathetic nervous system or the effects of the parasympathetic nervous system. Of course, that happens by blocking you know, the, uh, the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. So that is why they are also known as anticholinergic drugs. So if you think about it, uh, the, this group of drugs will block you know, the parasympathetic nervous system. No, kaya nga, tinawag siya na parasympatholytic. So of course, when it will block the parasympathetic nervous system, what uh, will predominate or, or what will take place or what will take over is the sympathetic nervous system. Again, when we say uh, sympathetic, that goes along with the fight or flight response or those are the responses that are essential uh, for survival no? and that happens during, uh, for example, emergency cases. So again, pag uh, parasympathetic, that is uh, rest, and the, rest and digest and live and let live. When we say sympathetic, that is more on the uh, fight or flight. So these drugs will again shut down the parasympathetic nervous system so that the sympathetic nervous system will predominate. So uh, one of the indications of the anticholinergic drugs or the parasympatholytic drugs is that they will prevent and decrease bradycardia or decrease in the heart rate. So if you have an animal now with serious bradycardia, then if we administer an anticholinergic drug, it will block the parasympathetic nervous system and uh, the heart rate will start to uh, go up after treatment with parasympatholytic drugs. Another indication is uh, it will decrease the salivary secretions. So again, no, as a review of the parasympathetic nervous system, so what it does in the body is that it is uh, beneficial for those resting activities like digestion. So if your animal is trying to digest food, they are going to produce a lot of secretions. So for example, in the GIT, no, as well as in the salivary gland. So we can decrease those secretions by administering parasympatholytic drugs. So why might that be a good thing for an animal undergoing anesthesia? So uh, this is important. Uh, the administration of the anticholinergic drug as a pre-anesthetic during a surgery or during uh, undergoing uh, for those animals undergoing anesthesia is that uh, the patient will not be, will not uh, develop aspiration of the saliva during the the induction of the anesthesia no, or during uh, anesthesia. Thus, we basically dry out a little bit the secretions of the salivary gland. So we decrease or we reduce the uh, salivary secretions. That is why the anticholinergic drugs are also known as the anti-sialogog drugs or anti sialogog no, because they will decrease the secretions of the salivary gland or they will uh, decrease no, your salivation. So this is again, this is important in order to prevent the aspiration of saliva during anesthesia. There are again two uh, common uh, types of anticholinergic drugs. These are atropine and glycopyrrolate and they are usually used in dogs and cats. In terms of the route of administration, so these are the routes of administration that where atropine can be administered. So we have the IV, IMSC, so these, these are parenteral routes as well as the intratracheal, no, intratracheal route. So usually the intratracheal route is um, indicated no, during emergency cases. Um, we also have the uh, pharmacokinetics of atropine and glycopyrrolate. So why would you choose one over the other? Why would you choose atropine and why would you choose glycopyrrolate? So of course, it will depend on the situation 
and it will depend on the uh, purpose of that particular uh, surgery, for example. In, ter uh, in the case of atropine, in terms of its onset of action, so it has a faster onset of action compared to that of glycopyrrolate. In terms of its peak activity, so it has a shorter peak of activity and a shorter duration. So when, uh, when would you want to use something that works really quickly, such as atropine? Of course, if you wanted to, you wanted a drug uh, that works really quickly in cases when there are emergency. You know? If it's an emergency, you're always going to use atropine unless you are dealing with horses or rabbits. So these two uh, species, horses and rabbits, are uh, they are not recommended to be given with parenteral atropine no? because in the case of um, horses they are especially more sensitive to the parenterally administered atropine and for, uh, for example uh, administration of um, sub uh, subcutaneous atropine to horses no, can lead to paraly paralytic effect especially on the GIT, it can cause severe colic or severe abdominal pain. Uh, it is also contraindicated in rabbits no, because uh, rabbits produce atropine esterase. This is an enzyme that will degrade atropine and make the product inactive. So in the case, again, of horses, uh, topical atropine instead of the parenteral atropine is being used in order to uh, decrease no, the intestinal motility and abdominal pain in horses. So in the case of the glycopyrrolate, it has a slower onset of action. It has a longer peak, of longer peak activity and a longer duration compared to that of atropine. So for glycopyrrolate, now you have the time to let the uh, the effect of this drug kick in after being administered. So it's going to last longer compared to that of atropine. So uh, if you are dealing, for example, with, uh, with a horse or rabbit, we don't want to give atropine too. So glycopyrrolate can be indicated in this purpose uh, for horse and rabbit. And uh, if you have, for example, a surgery that will take longer so you can prefer glycopyrrolate instead of atropine. So most of the surgeries, of course, when we are going to talk about surgeries, no, most of the surgeries that we do are short duration. No, if, for example, if that is a minor surgery. So uh, we can uh, use, again, atropine in that case no, because it has uh, atropine has a shorter duration compared to that of uh, glycopyrrolate. But if you want a longer duration of action from your anticholinergic, if you're going to uh, conduct a major surgery, you're going to do some, for example, orthopedic procedure that will take a while, then you might choose glycopyrrolate. So atropine you know, is usually enough for most of the surgeries. But of course, the most commonly used is atropine. So this slide you now we'll compare the atropine and the glycopyrrolate. So both drugs you now can be given subcutaneously or uh, IM as a, for pre-anesthetic purposes, or it can also be given IV for emergency treatment of bradycardia and cardiac arrest. So atropine is generally preferred for emergencies due to its quicker onset of action compared to that of glycopyrrolate. In terms of the specific onset of action and the duration of action for uh, IM atropine, so its onset of action is about 5 minutes after administration. It peaks at 10 to 20 minutes and its duration of action is about 60 to 90 minutes. Uh, of course, when it will be given IV, it will be faster. Uh, its onset is only about 1 minute. It will peak at three to four minutes and its duration would also be uh, faster for several minutes only. 
uh, when we are going to compare that with IM, glycopyrrolate, so in terms of the peak, uh, peak of the uh, onset or peak activity rather, it has a longer peak of activity that is at 30 to 45 minutes. And for its duration, it is also longer at 2 to 3 hours. We also have here a you know, comparison between glycopyrrolate and atropine in terms of their ability to cross the blood-brain barrier. So for the glycopyrrolate, uh, it is you know, an anticholinergic drug that will not be able to cross the blood-brain blood, uh, blood barrier as compared to that of atropine, which will be able you know, to cross the blood-brain barrier. Uh, we also have another uh, anticholinergic drug, scopolamine. It is an uh, anticholinergic drug that will, cause, will cross you know, the blood-brain barrier. So the scopolamine is mainly used to manage the post-operative nausea and vomiting, as well as uh, it is also used to treat motion sickness. So this table shows the differences you know, between the uh, pharmacokinetics of uh, atropine and glycopyrrolate. Now, in terms of their lipid solubility, atropine is lipid soluble compared to that of glycopyrrolate. Uh, of course, in terms of crossing the blood-brain barrier, since atropine is lipid soluble, it will be able to cross the blood-brain barrier and produce no central anticholinergic effects. Uh, we also have here you know, the for the treatment. You now, it is uh, atropine is indicated for bradycardia for intraoperative bradycardia and uh, in these uh, indications. For glycopyrrolate, it is indicated mainly for intraoperative bradycardia. So this diagram shows the comparative effects of the anticholinergic drugs, atropine, glycopyrrolate, and uh, scopolamine. So in terms of their sedative effect, scopolamine is more potent compared to that of atropine. For its anti-sialogogue effect, so scopolamine is more potent than glycopyrrolate and atropine. In terms of its ability to increase the heart rate, so atropine is the most potent of the three. In terms of its ability to re relax the smooth muscle, so atropine and glycopyrrolate have the same potency. We also have its effects on midriasis, uh, prevention of the motion sickness, so Scopolamine is mainly indicated for that purpose. Decrease in the gastric uh, secretion as well as altering the fatal heart rates. For the pharmacokinetics of atropine and glycopyrrolate, so in terms of its lipid solubility, atropine is lipid soluble compared to that of glycopyrrolate. Because of this, it will be able to cross you know, the blood-brain barrier uh, compared to uh, glycopyrrolate. In terms of its uh, excretion, so the atropine is uh, unchanged when it is excreted, 18% of it, and glycopyrrolate is 80% unchanged. So atropine is again indicated for the treatment of bradycardia at a low dose. It is also indicated for intraoperative bradycardia. The same is true with glycopyrrolate. For the anticholinergic effects, produced by the anticholinergic drugs on different body systems. Starting with the CNS, so in the CNS, uh, the anticholinergic drugs has a limited effects, except of course for those uh, drugs that are able to cross the blood-brain barrier in, uh, and cause you know, the, uh, the anticholinergic effects in the CNS. We also have oh, for the cardiovascular, uh, this is really the Big one. Now, this is really important because the these drugs will prevent and treat bradycardia. And uh, what they do is what it will do you know, is it will increase the heart rate. And the next one is on the secretion. So basically, the anticholinergic drugs will decrease the secretion of, for example, the salivary gland and other exocrine glands in the body. We also have in the eyes, so they will cause midriasis or pupillary dilation and also corneal drying. So why is there corneal drying? This is because the, there is a decrease in the tear production. We also have uh, on the lungs, we have the bronchodilation. So uh, this is a good thing 
no bronchodilation during uh, anesthesia because the drug will be able to open up the airways. Now, the animal gets more oxygen. The animal gets more gas and the anesthetic plane is better when there is bronchodilation. So you can see how the anticholinergic agents that will be able is beneficial during uh, anesthesia and which is why these drugs are um, used you know, as an adjunct to anesthetic agents. These are the uh, adverse effects of anticholinergic agents. So we'll start with uh, its effects on the heart. So it can cause cardiac arrhythmia or irregular in heart rate. So if you have an animal that already has a heart disease or pre-existing arrhythmic conditions, that results in arrhythmia or generally elevated heart rate. Uh, so this is uh, considered to be a contraindication of the anticholinergic drug. So these animals should not be uh, should should not be uh, administered with anticholinergic drugs now because it can worsen or it, it can increase now, the level of arrhythmia. So another important consideration in the case of anticholinergic drugs, particularly atropine, is that it can cause temporary bradycardia. So if you're going to give atropine, temporary, you can get you know, a temporary dip in the heart rate and uh, eventually that will go up at a later time. So that should be taken into consideration as well as the contraindications of the anticholinergic drug. So just be aware you know, that if you give atropine and you wonder why the heart rate started going down, it might have been uh, due to the temporary bradycardia, temporary initial bradycardia that will be caused by atropine. Another uh, adverse effect that can be caused by the anticholinergic agents are thickened respiratory and salivary secretion. So it decreases, of course, the, the, these drugs will decrease now the secretions of the uh, different exocrine glands in the body so that all the drooling and associated effects will be decreased, but it will also at the same time thus thicken them up. So in terms of the consistency, for example, the saliva, it will thicken the saliva. So if, for instance, an animal were to aspirate the thickened secretions, it will cause the, uh, it will lead to the blockage of the airway, particularly in cats and ruminants. So less, uh, another effect also would be it can cause uh, the aspiration of the regular fluid. And again, it can cause the blockage. Okay, we also have the uh, another adverse effect is that it can cause the intestinal peristalsis inhibition. So it can inhibit the peristalsis in the intestine. So again, anticholinergic drug will slow down the GID. It stops the peristaltic movement of the uh, GID, and this is considered to be a big problem in horses because horses are commonly affected with colic or abdominal pain to begin with. So horses and rabbits, so one reason that we want to avoid atropine is that, of course, they can vomit. They are very prone to GI tract stasis. So if the GIT stops moving, it is much more a bigger problem in horses and rabbits than it is in other animals. So you can also get bloat in ruminants you know, when uh, there is the inhibition in the GIT uh, movement or peristalsis due to the administration of anticholinergic drugs. Pharmacological effects of uh, anticholinergic drugs, particularly atropine. So again, uh, these drugs are classified as sympathomimetics and they will mimic the action of sympathetic nervous system. So the first one is on the heart to increase the heart rate. It will induce tachycardia. So what, uh, what it does is, of course, it will block you know, the receptor, uh, muscarinic receptor in the heart, and it will also block the stimulation of the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is, it has a parasympathetic innervation. It will stimulate, it will innervate the heart to 
produce parasympathetic effect or a slowing of the heart rate. So there are different factors that can stimulate the vagus nerve during anesthesia and cause decrease in heart rate. So one of that is when you are going to do endotracheal intubation. Another is handling of the abdominal organs in surgery and other anesthetic agents. Additionally, atropine protects the heart, no, but care should be taken because it can, uh, tachycardia can occur. So this uh, drug should not be used in patients with congestive heart failure or hyperthyroidism or if an animal is tachycardic before anesthesia. Atropine you know, is also important because it will decrease the salivation during uh, anesthesia or surgery. So of course, it is uh, atropine is considered to be a anti sialogo because you now it will decrease the salivation. So some agents can cause increased salivation, for example, ketamine, and this can be problematic when trying to intubate the patient and can even compromise the airway. So that is the use of um, atropine. It, it, is, it will decrease salivation. For example, uh, when you are going to perform a surgery, so you need to prevent the salivation or in order to prevent the aspiration of fluid that can cause, for example, aspiration pneumonia. Another uh, effect of atropine or anticholinergic drug is that it, it will reduce the uh, GI activity. No, it will inhibit peristalsis, whereas other agents no, can cause flatulence, vomiting, and diarrhea. So don't use this if you know that the patient has ill use because it will make you know, the condition worse. Atropine can also cause pupillary dilation or midriasis. Uh, we also have reduction in the tear production and it can affect the tear production or secretion dramatically. So this drug is contraindicated with glaucoma and always lubricate the eyes no matter what anesthetic agent is being used. So atropine administration during surgery can also cause dry corneas because during anesthesia, uh, the eyes don't close and also there is also a re reduction in the tear production. In terms of the effects of atropine on the respiratory system or in the lungs, it can cross the opening of the airway or bronchodilation. So one of the disadvantages of this is that it can cause increase in the dead space in the lungs or the parts of the respiratory system that contain air, but oxygen and carbon dioxide are not exchanged. If that space is too large, the animal can get hypoxic. So another effect of atropine is that it, it can increase the airway mucus secretions in cats. And these secretions, when it will be aspirated, it can cause the blocking of the airway. For the uh, toxicity of atropine, so atropine can cause uh, drowsiness during overdose, again, because it can cross the BBB. It can also cause excitement for the same reason. Dry mucous membranes, no, because um, of course, you now atropine is will decrease the tear production. Uh, it can also cause ataxia, muscle tremor, dilated pupils or midriasis, hyperthermia, you know, because of its central anticholinergic effect, and of course tachycardia. Uh, dogs are more susceptible to tox atropine toxicity, and this can be treated with physostigmine. Finally, now again in terms of their effect, so much longer yung duration of effect of glycopyrrolate compared to that of atropine. In terms of its side effect, so it has less tachycardia and less arrhythmia that is seen with glycopyrrolate compared to that of atropine. It, it is also a better anti sialogo meaning that it will decrease the salivation better compared to that of atropine. It is more expensive and it is safer for pregnant animals. In terms of the treatment of bradycardia, so atropine is better at probably treating this uh, condition because again, atropine has a uh, faster onset of action.